Here's a short clip from a prior episode of Emphasis Added. Hope you enjoy. Go Governor Northam said that the system doesn't treat people fairly. And so I know we've talked about innocence and we've talked about that first part of the trial and we've talked a little bit about that second part of a trial. But in, in that sentencing phase, w what is it about it that people like, that lacks fairness? What lacks fairness is that people are sentenced to death based on three factors that most people would think should be irrelevant to the criminal justice system. Uh, one is what is their race or ethnicity. One is what is the race or ethnicity of the person they killed. And one is how much money do they have? So the wealth of the defendant, the race of the defendant, the race of the victim. And I think that intuitively, most people think that those factors should not matter in the criminal justice system. Look, we live in a in a capitalist society, and I understand that, and I'm not a socialist, and so I think that capitalism is on balance good, even though it creates inequality. It means that if you've got a whole lot of money, you can take a private plane wherever you want to go, and if you don't have a lot of money, you got to take a bus, and if you have a lot of money, you can eat steak and caviar for dinner, and if you don't have a lot of money, eat bologna sandwiches. I recognize all of that. There's a price that we pay for having a market economy. And one of those prices is that we have inequality. And I think that even most recently in the COVID experience, we've seen that people who have wealth and access are having access to better medical care and attention than people who have less access to those things. And so we tolerate these sorts of inequalities across almost every social domain. But I think the one place where those disparities are not supposed to matter is in the criminal justice system. That's why under the Supreme Court, it says equal justice under law. Everybody's supposed to be the same. And so once you discover that you're not the same in the criminal justice system, that people who have money are better off than people who don't, that people who are white are better off than people who are of color, it really causes you to pause and think we maybe need to make some real adjustments here in a way that we're not necessarily inclined to do when it comes to the fact that some people have to take the bus and some people get to fly on private jets. And I think that that is what the governor had in mind. That's certainly my experience. And to the extent that those sorts of factors are not only playing a significant role, but often playing a determinative role in the death penalty that we have in America that makes the system intolerable. I'll just mention one quick example to you there. Nationwide, there's something like 2,600 people um, on death row. And most homicides are intra-racial. That is, most white people are killed by a white guy. Most black people killed by a black guy, most Hispanics killed by a Hispanic. It's not 100% true, it's mostly true. Blacks and whites are victims of homicide in about equal number, even though blacks only make up a third of the population, less than a third of the population. Blacks and whites are victims of homicide in equal number. Yet the number of blacks on death row nationwide equals the number of whites on death row. Nation. That should not be true. There, there, there should be, there, there, there should be a third more white people on death row, taking all of these other factors into consideration. But, but there aren't. Well, why not? Well, there's only two factors that explain it. Uh, one is race, um, and one is that people of color are disproportionately represented in the lower income strata. Those are the only two factors that explain it. And so, if that's the criminal justice system that you have, and you care about racial equality, you care about economic equality, then you are inevitably forced to the conclusion that the death penalty system is, is simply intolerable. It's morally and ethically intolerable. And, and what is it about wealth? I mean, is, constitutionally, all, all people mm -hmm. are, are allowed to have a lawyer, right? So what is it about money that, that disadvantages poor people with the death penalty in particular? What it is about money is that if you are indigent, you are uh, relying on either a public defender or a, 
private lawyer who's appointed to represent you. And in Texas, there is not a statewide public defender office that represents indigent defendants who are facing a death sentence. And so what that means is that indigent capital defendants are getting a private court-appointed lawyer. Some of those lawyers are very good. I would not have said that 25 years ago. But today I will say that some of those lawyers are very good. But it does not matter how good you are if you don't have the resources to do all of the thorough type of investigation that a that a lawyer retained by somebody who has a whole lot of money uh, can do. You're you're probably too too young to remember, and probably most of the people who are listening to this are too young to remember, but. O.J. Simpson had a trial at which he was on trial for killing two people, right. and he had what was called the dream team of lawyers. He had Johnny Cochran, he had Barry Sheck, he had F. Lee Bailey, he had Peter Neufeld. He had, he had more lawyers than could fit at council table, and the lawyers were great, but it was not just the lawyers. He had investigators that you don't even know about because they're not household names. And you have to have a whole lot of money to be able to assemble a team like that. And there's nobody who is an indigent defendant in Texas who gets that kind of money. You get two lawyers appointed to represent you, but there's a presumptive cap on the amount of money that the county is going to pay them. And once that cap is reached, maybe the lawyers are going to get paid if they spend additional money and maybe they're not. And so if you're a lawyer, and the reason you're a lawyer is because it's how you earn your living. It's how you pay the mortgage. It's how you buy the groceries. It's how you keep the lights on. You're not going to you're you're not going to go into a hole in a case. You're not going to spend 30, 40, 50,000 dollars conducting an investigation that maybe you're not going to get paid back for. And so what will happen when you have a wealthy defendant who can pay a lawyer to do all of those things will often not happen when you have an indigent defendant who's forced to rely on the county. The lawyer is perfectly good. If the lawyer had all that money at her disposal, she would spend it in a good way, but yeah. she doesn't. And so what I tell people is you can have Clarence Darrow representing you, but if Clarence Darrow doesn't have any money to go conduct the investigation that has to be conducted for a trial lawyer to be prepared to try the case, then you're going to get convicted and sentenced to death, notwithstanding the fact that you got Clarence General representing you. And indigent defendants don't have those kind of resources to pay for that investigation. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from a prior episode of Emphasis Added, the podcast by the Houston Law Review. If you like what you saw, check out more on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform.